All right. Hi, everybody, and thank you for coming to the second last uh, episode, so to speak, or talk of the, our speaker series. Um, and it's a great pleasure to introduce David Dunano today. Um, I have introduced in, uh, I've bumped into David uh, in both Cambridges, uh, first in the UK and, and he then here in the other Cambridge in the US. And every time I talk about his to him about his research and stuff, I'm super impressed by the depth and breadth of his work. And uh, I think as a side note, I think I emailed out a reference to his kernel cookbook, which I think was part of his thesis originally, at least a few times a year. It's just, uh, you know, it, it's just a super clean and understandable resource for people who are starting to work on in Gaussian processes and they need to understand what kernels are doing and how to combine and stuff like that. Um, so David right now is an assistant professor in computer science at the University of Toronto. Um, and his research focuses on continuous time models, latent variable models, and deep learning. Uh, he did this postdoc at this Cambridge, Harvard, at Harvard University, and his PhD at the other Cambridge, the University of Cambridge. Uh, David is a founding member of the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence and also co founded Invenia, uh, which is an energy forecasting company. So without further ado, let's hear David's talk. Hi. I'm David Duvino, and I'm going to be telling you today about latent stochastic differential equations, a newly practical class of models that I hope you'll explore with me. So a summary of this talk is that I'm going to introduce this family of models that allows arbitrary parametric dynamics and likelihoods through continuous time um, and pre presents a well-defined tractable generative model uh, whose marginal likelihood we can estimate tractably. So just like something like Gaussian processes, this is a family of models over uh, continuous time processes that can handle sort of arbitrary connections to your data. Um, I'm going to briefly review the technical uh, improvements that made this practical developed um, by my group and others in around 2019 and 2020, some recent progress on improving our gradient estimators, and then some directions, some future directions that I'm interested in about applying this to time series, Bayesian neural networks, and um, multiple multi-scale physical models. So the motivation for this whole line of research was originally uh, dealing with irregularly sampled data sets. And if you talk to anyone in business or medicine, they'll say, oh yeah, we heard the hype about machine learning and we tried to apply it, but our data set doesn't really look like a bunch of images or um, you know, a bunch of vectors with corresponding labels. It looks more like at a bunch of different times, we made a bunch of different measurements about the patient or the customer um, or whatever you know business we're trying to interact with. Uh, so we end up with a data set that looks something like this, where we have a bunch of different measurements, like maybe the blood pressure or temperature of a patient, or maybe some interventions we made on them uh, across time. <clears throat> and it's not exactly clear how to apply modern machine learning or deep learning to these methods. Um, if we wanted to do something like a recurrent neural network or a hidden Markov model, we would have to discretize or somehow bin time. Um, the theme of this talk series is, of course, automatic machine learning. And the general um, approach that I'm going to advocate for is that if we meet the data where it is, if, we, if our model can handle the raw data coming from the sensor, this removes a major part of the pipeline that is typically done in an ad hoc way by humans. So how can we model uh, irregularly sampled time series data directly from the sensor or the measurement or the patient's chart without any sort of binning or pre-processing. So uh, we're going to have to move into continuous time. And when we do that, there's only really a few sets of tools we can use. And one of the main ones is differential equations. And just to warm up and make sure we're all in the same set of notation, um, I'm going to briefly review ordinary differential equations. Uh, in this setting, there's some vector valued state Z, which could represent the state of the patient or some planets in motion or chemical concentrations, and some function F that tells us how that state changes through time as a function of the current state and the current time. Uh, so we can, rep we can view this function as a vector field defined over the state Z and the time T. Um, Usually what we want to do if we're making predictions in this setting is we start with an initial uh, state at z at time zero, and to find the state at some later time, we integrate this field over time, um, computing a trajectory of the state. Uh, so if we start at some initial time here, 
that trajectory will look like the one that follows the gradient field at every point. Um, there's a whole field of uh, numerical computing that attempts to figure out how to compute or to approximate this integral efficiently. Um, the oldest and simplest method, of course, is Euler's method that just says take the current state and add a small step in the direction of the current uh, vector. And this makes these uh, trajectories that with a moderate step size often quickly diverge from the true uh, solution. Of course, luckily there's been a hundred years of progress in this field developing sophisticated adaptive solvers, which take large steps when the field is sort of predictable and take small steps when the field is complicated. Um, in all of this work, I'm going to try to, to avoid discretizing time so that we can use adaptive ODE and, and SDE solvers and take advantage of like all this amazing work done in the numerics community. Okay, so now let's go to particular architectures that we can use to handle continuous time. So the simplest ones, and you should always start with these simple and fast architectures, even though they're kind of limited, is a standard sort of recurrent neural network setup where we have a hidden state that's some vector h, that these are like the activations of the, uh, the neurons, um, and then whenever we see an observation xi at some particular time, we're going to have this, uh, this function that just takes in the old state and the new observation and, and gives us the new state. Um, so if we plot the state as a series of lines uh, through time, they get instantaneously updated at every uh, time and then nothing changes <clears throat> in between the observations. Um, the uh, sort of first refinement that we can add to this model is to allow these hidden states to change in between times. Um, and so if we think of this H as some sort of belief state, this makes a lot of sense where imagine I'm waiting for my friend at the bus stop, uh, even though, you know, so maybe this, this time is when I just, uh, this is when I call them, this is when I arrive at the bus stop and then I'm waiting and I don't see anything for a while. Um, the fact that my friend hasn't arrived is telling me something about what's going on with him. And maybe I think that he's late or something happened to him. My beliefs are updating continuously through time, even though I'm not getting any new observations um, until they finally arrive and then I have an instantaneous update. So this kind of model is easy to handle. And all we do is we say in between the observations, the hidden state is evolving according to, to some parametric ODE that we're going to learn. We're going to parameterize as a neural network and, and fit to data. And we can do this with the normal sort of gradient based training approaches. Um, so the main problem with this uh, class of models is that this hidden state H it represents a, a belief state and it doesn't actually uh, explicitly represent our uncertainty or any sort of interpretable uh, information about these, um, the state that we're actually modeling. And it, this also means it's not a well-defined generative model. I could have a function that tells me what the probability of different uh, observations are at different times, but it's not clear how I could, um, for instance, condition on extra information that I just learned that you know had happened in the past. Um, there's, is a, it only supports a very limited set of queries. The other thing that's funny about this sort of model in general is that there's no explicit use of Bayes rule. Um, so this thing has to learn how to incorporate data from scratch, which is good if you don't think you have a good model of the system, but it's bad if you do have a good generative model in the case of like uh, physical systems or chemical systems uh, where you using a generative model in Bayes rule to make the updates would save you a lot of learning. So a class of models that I think is really on the right track and I, I really like is uh, deep Markov models, also called deep common filters. Um, and these are a generalization of classical models called common filters or hidden Markov models that say, assume that there's some hidden but unknown state Z. And this Z represents the true state of the world, which we don't observe. The only thing we observe is some noisy emissions or uh, data that's a function of the current state. So in the common filter, the classic application was missile tracking, where Z was the position and velocity of a missile. Um, it's moving according to its own physical dynamics uh, at some that we're modeling at some discretized time. And at each step, we maybe see some noisy partial radio, radar return that tells us something, a noisy version of the missile's position and velocity. Um, of course, having these random variables in our model means that we have to somehow do inference. And uh, if we want to do training or prediction, we have to approximate a posterior over this latent Z and make predictions. 
and that's a whole uh, course. But this model is very flexible. It supports arbitrary queries. It's more interpretable. So if you're willing to pay the price of doing approximate inference, uh, this is a much more flexible model class. OK, so the deep Markov models, though, usually operate again in discrete time. And uh, we, as I said, we want to meet the data where it lives and not have to discretize time. So the simplest way we might uh, move this to continuous time is to say, OK, uh, we'll have a model where there's some initial unknown state of the system, like the position and velocity of the missile, and assume that it evolves deterministically according to some dynamics function f. Um, and then again, we see our noisy observations at arbitrary time points. Um, so again, now we have this well-defined distribution over hidden states at all times, and we can ha handle data coming at arbitrary, irregularly sampled time. Um, so in this model, there's the dynamics function and the hidden states that we have to sort of learn all at once. And it maybe that seems like a chicken and egg problem to you, but it, it sort of magically works if you just throw it all into a gradient-based optimizer. So here's what that looks like on a toy problem. Um, in this example, the green dots are some uh, data points. So yeah, x-axis is time. Here we're seeing noisy observations based on some hidden uh, latent state that we never observed. Um, the f function, the, the instantaneous dynamics function, here we're showing a two-dimensional slice of it. Um, again, it lives in a different space than the, the data observations. So we're actually free to choose its dimension. Um, usually, if you just sort of make it a little, little bit larger than you need, everything works fine. So here we're making it four-dimensional. And now I'm going to show you uh, us jointly learning the hidden trajectories of all of these three different um, the time series and the shared dynamics that they all follow. Right. So as we see, um, you know, creating based optimization can kind of fit everything all together. And again, there's like huge gaps in the time uh, in the data in this simple example. So uh, jointly training everything uh, as a variational autoencoder to maximize the marginal likelihood, integrating over the hidden latent state uh, works, at least in this, this toy example. Um, so to get started on this research agenda, we applied this data to PhysioNet, which is a data set of um, patient records in an intensive care unit. And so here's a particular patient over 48 hours and all the different types of measurements that were made on them. And so we can do things like try to predict uh, the sort of future trajectory of them or whether they died in their time in the ICU, different tasks. Um, as I mentioned, you should always start with this sort of simple and fast, quick and dirty methods. If you're just doing prediction where you fit a recurrent neural network that is allowed to um, have varying uh, gaps between the data sets. So we call that RNN delta T. It actually, the update uh, function also gets to know what the time from the last observation was. So in principle, it has all the information it needs, but it has to learn everything again from scratch. Um, again, allowing the dynamics to change in between observations, the ODE RNN uh, works a little bit better. But works, what works even better is that sort of more complicated model I said that says that there's these latent um, trajectories and we have to uh, do variational inference to identify, or rather to approximate our posterior over those latent trajectories. So this is sort of the heavyweight Bayesian method. It works a bit better though. Um, okay, so um, this isn't quite what we wanted though, right? So this is a funny model because it says that <clears throat> There's an unknown initial state of the system, Z of T0, that then evolves according, determin evolves deterministically. And there's no room for some, you know, unobserved or surprising interaction to happen that we didn't explicitly model in the initial state. So if a patient, for instance, like gets hit by a car or something, the only way this model could handle that would be to somehow say that it was in their initial state and they were like fated to get hit by that car on that day. <clears throat> um, so the more data that we want to model, the longer the sequence we want to model, generally we'll have to stick more and more information into this initial state and the model becomes very unnatural and doesn't match uh, reality. We want to be able to handle all sorts of minor sort of random interactions with our system that we can't explicitly, that we can't necessarily observe exa uh, explicitly. So the way this usually shows up in sort of standard discrete time models is they, they say, okay, they have some sort of stochastic transition dynamics where the state at some time, uh, you know, T2 is a, uh, depends sort of in a stochastic way on the uh, 
state at the previous time. So one sort of cartoony way we could write this is to say that the new state is the old state plus some deterministic um, transformation plus some noise that's different for every um, every time transition. Um, so this is fine, and this is you know what deep Markov models do, and I, and that's a strength of that approach. But how can we do this in the continuous time setting? Well, the sort of the standard way that I end up making con continuous time models is to start with a discrete time one and then just shrink the time step smaller and smaller. <clears throat> so what if we took this kind of update and said, okay, there's actually many millions of uh, tiny uh, transitions happening at, between every time step that we observe. Uh, we might end up with some sort of stochastic ODE. So let's try to sort of formalize this a little more carefully. Uh, if we had our old deterministic dynamics and we wanted to add noise, it's kind of hard to do this without the noise instantaneously being either zero or infinite. And the way that um, sort of measure theorists worked out to express this is to say, okay, the change in Z <clears throat> is this deterministic thing times the change in time. That's the same old ODE that we had before, um, plus some uh, some noise term. And this noise term has two parts. One is just this, this scale function sigma that depends on the current time and it says how much noise is there. And the actual noise is represented as the change uh, in a Brownian motion over this time interval. And so it's just, uh, the Brownian motion is just integrated white noise and then we're sort of taking a derivative of that with respect to time. So it turns out that this sort of roundabout construction of um, Gaussian noise is, is needed in order to make sure we can take limits sensibly. So I found this a little bit intimidating when I first started learning about stochastic differential equations, but really this is just, you know, some sigma times some standard normal noise that in constructed in such a way that we can talk about smaller and larger uh, time steps. Okay, so if I choose an initial uh, Z0 and I write down one of these stochastic differential equations, that defines a distribution over functions. And the way I can sample from that distribution is just start at ZT0, um, sample a Brownian motion, and then just integrate through time, just like I did with the ODE. Um, so here's a, a particular stochastic differential equation that's been fit to this data, and we'll talk about how to do that later. And these purple paths are just different. Uh, well, I actually have randomness at the first step. We sample our first Z of T0, and then depending on our Brownian motion, we will follow slightly different trajectories. Um, here, the drift function is visualized by these little gray arrows, and they're sort of saying, keep the, you know, even if you, your noise takes you away from this uh, curve, the drift function is gonna, gonna kind of steer you to that area. So it's a very, I mean, SDEs are like a very old technology, and they're very expressive, and um, they've been used, to, you know, to some extent in, let's say finance, but not really much in sort of standard machine learning time series models until recently. And there's a few reasons why they're kind of difficult to handle algorithmically. So first of all, I wanna say, if we could use them, what would they be good for? Um, and they're basically a natural fit for any system where there's many small unobserved interactions. So the very first SDE uh, is Brownian motion where the scientist named Brown was observing dead pollen molecules under in, in water and noticing that they still moved even though they were, they were dead. Of course, Einstein's, uh, one of his first major contributions was to explain this by just saying, oh, but that's because all these the little tiny unobserved interactions with water molecules that are adding up to make this uh, sort of wiggly motion. Um, also in a gene pool, so geneticists use SDEs to model the uh, trajectories of different uh, gene frequencies through time. And anytime an animal dies or has a baby or whatever, its allele frequencies will increase or decrease by sort of a finite amount. But if we imagine sort of a sufficiently large population that looks like an instantaneous uh, infinitesimal change. Same with when people sort of learn things in a market, then the prices change a little bit instantaneously. One sort of common misconception is that I, this, this family of SCEs is somehow limited because I'm choosing to use Brownian motion here, which is just kind of like Gaussian noise. Um, and that this somehow means that I can only handle like Gaussian perturbations, but no, this is Gaussian because the central limit theorem has kicked in. And even if we were starting from a bunch of discrete um, interventions, when we have enough of them and they're small enough and their variance is you know, well behaved, then the instantaneous updates all become Gaussian. So 
what I'd like to do is say, just like every other object in uh, physics and math, let's stick some neural networks in these dynamics functions, this uh, drift and diffusion function, and fit the whole thing to data. And that will have a sort of like the best of all both worlds in terms of being able to handle instantaneous data with sort of unseen interventions. Okay, so there was a little bit of math that was required to write down gradients with respect to ordinary differential equations in a nice way. And so again, when we're training, uh, the idea is that we'll have some scalar loss function that's a function of the parameters of our neural network, um, and that loss function depends on some ODE solution that depends on theta. Um, to get the gradients, um, we could just backprop through the solver, but this has high memory cost. So instead, what we can do is write the sort of backprop equations. If we take the infinitesimal limit, uh, this is sort of like what you would use to, to train a, a ResNet. If we take a sort of infinitesimally many steps, we end up with another ODE uh, such that the solving that ODE gives us the exact gradient that we need. Um, so if we have an ODE solver sitting around, we can get all the gradients that we need by just uh, writing down some augmented system in terms of gradients of each layer, or rather the dynamics function with respect to its state and its uh, gradients. And that's all available through automatic differentiation, uh, the same asymptotic time and memory cost as evaluating the dynamics function in the first place. Um, and so this will give us exact gradients. Um, and the reason that we want to use an ODE solver to compute the uh, gradients is that it can let us save memory. So um, you can't always do this if the differential equation you're modeling is sort of poorly behaved enough. This won't, uh, this won't be like an attractive approach. But for sort of at least many practical settings, um, you can avoid the standard requirement for reverse mode auto diff that says that you have to store all the intermediate activations of your neural network. Um, instead, if your uh, network is defined, or if your system is defined by an ODE, when it's time to compute the gradient and you need to reconstruct, or you need to know what the states were as uh, a function of time, you can just compute them by going backwards from the final state. And so if you want to express that as like a, a forward ODE, you can say the backward F ODE, the, its dynamics are just the same as the forward one with the negative sign in front of its output and time. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> if you want to write this as like a single algorithm, it just says, okay, make this augmented dynamics function that takes the current uh, state and computes some gradients instantaneously, and then pass that to a big ODE solver that runs backwards in time. Um, okay, so, I'm saying we had a construction of stochastic differential equations, which is just an ODE with this extra noise term. So why don't we just use the same adjoint method to train our STEs? Um, so there's a few problems with that. I'm gonna quickly go through the, the solutions. So first of all, I wanna convince you that this is actually a hard thing to do. And so some brilliant probabilists, uh, uh, Senator Majinski looked into this in 2019. And uh, you know, to my surprise, said that there was no straightforward way to port this construction to STEs. And um, looking through the literature myself, there's like all sorts of sort of similar objects called like backward SDEs, which is not actually what we want. Um, and no one had actually worked out uh, how to take these sort of pathwise gradients that we need to train these networks in the same way that we would uh, neural ODEs. Um, I do wanna give a shout out to Terry Lyons group and uh, Patrick Heger, who have been working on like an alternate construction that sort of avoids the needs to talk about stochastic differential equations altogether called rough path theory, but it, uh, it it sort of hadn't been worked out when we first started working on these. Okay, so the basic question that had to be solved amazingly was, what does it mean to run a stochastic differential equation backwards? And this should seem like not a very hard thing to do, right? Uh, let me just get this animation going. So if I want, so here's me integrating a sample from an SDE forwards, if I want to integrate it backwards, that's just like another integral being evaluated in a different way. The problem is just that SDEs had kind of conflated the integration uh, of this uh, function with conditioning in a sort of infinite series of random variables. And so it was hard to disentangle those. Um, and I assumed, and I checked empirically that if you just slap some more negative signs in front of the um, diffusion function that everything works out. And it does if you use a Sertanovich uh, form, which is just like one of the two ways of building an SDE. Um, and I talked, I worked with some careful probabilists, uh, Zhui Chen Li and Leonard Wang, who 
first said that, well, this isn't even a well-defined question, um, but later we're able to actually work out the, the details and, and, and give a construction for like this reverse SDE that does have this form that gives you the, the exact gradient that we need. Um, and of course, some of the original SDE people had been playing around with similar ideas recently. Okay, the other uh, technical challenge is how do we store the noise, um, this Brownian motion, right? So um, when we're integrating our SDE forward, we need to evaluate this Brownian motion at a whole bunch of different points. And when we're running it backwards, we need to evaluate it at a bunch more points. And I just said, I don't want to have to store all these intermediate quantities. Um, one interesting point I want to make is that, you know, in 2013, machine learning rediscovered the reparameterization trick and saying, stick all your noise in this parameter, uh, parameter into these parameterless random variables, and then all your gradients will work. And the SDE people had already done this like 50 or 60 years ago, where they said, we're going to stick all our randomness into this parameterless Brownian motion. So I didn't, we didn't have to do any reparameterization trick that had already been done for us by the SDE people. Um, but yeah, how do we store a, a sample of an entire noisy function? Um, the answer had, part, had been partially worked out by people like Terry Lyons when they had this Brownian tree that said, oh, well, if I, uh, I can sample a Brownian motion by sampling its endpoints, which are marginally Gaussian, and then condition on those to sort of zooming in um, along a tree and um, bisecting the time interval and taking conditional samples based on the sort of surrounding values of the Brownian bridge. And all we noted is that you don't actually have to store this entire tree. You can reconstruct any particular uh, branch on it that you need by just keeping track of the random numbers that you use along the way, or rather reconstructing them as a function of their place on the tree. So this is a new, or let's say like a improvement on an old data structure that has constant memory and sort of uh, logarithmic in the time resolution uh, time cost that lets us sample from an entire random function arbitrarily finally without having to store anything. Okay, so this is like another new technology. So when we stick this all together, um, we can generalize the old sort of ODE gradient method, which we which sort of inherited the name, the adjoint sensitivity method to the stochastic differential equation adjoint sensitivity method. And it's really uh, exactly what you would guess if someone said, okay, you have ODEs, but you have this extra uh, function. How do you generalize this method? You just kind of copy everything you did for the deterministic part to the random part and make some extra copies of the noise. and uh, it's sort of, again, like just what you would guess it would be, but we actually proved it correct, which is satisfying. So it's the grown up version of this, this paper. Um, so again, just to reiterate, the reason that we're doing this is we want gradients that scale well with the uh, length of the integration time and with the number of parameters in our model. And so uh, sort of, if you talk to like some of the Julia people, they'll say, well, uh, yes, you can do backprop, but, if you, but uh, for small models, you should use forward differentiation. And that's that's totally fine. That that scales to like maybe a few hundred parameters um, where it's basically finite differences where you just uh, solve the uh, SDE forward once for every parameter in your uh, model. Um, you could also, again, just store all the intermediate quantities that you compute when you're um, you know, sampling from the SDE and backprop through that, like like just normal, and that of course will have a memory co cost that grows with the um, well, the state, the size of your state, and the number of steps in your solve. So that doesn't work for very large systems for for long integration times. Um, and so our system ends up having constant memory costs, which means it scales really well, and it has this time cost that's almost as good as just solving the SDE on the forward pass. And this is maybe almost like a pessimistic. Uh, time cost here, but the point is, is it's still uh, L log L, which is about as good as you could ever want. Okay, so now we have efficient gradients for SDEs, which we didn't before. Uh, efficient and scalable. Um, the last part is, I mentioned for the ODE stuff, we're making this all a sort of variational autoencoder where we have a generative model that has some initial states at zero, then some th differential equation dynamics. The new part here, this is the same as the this whole thing is the same as the ODE model. The new part is that we have this Brownian motion, this like sort of infinitely large random uh, vector, 
that's informing the trajectories. Um, and so this is modeling all those like little unseen interventions that I was saying we'd like to have in our model. Um, and so again, we can treat this as an, a variational autoencoder where we have another recognition model that looks at the data and then outputs an approximate posterior over all this latent stuff. So uh, this is like, I think a kind of fun model class. Uh, there's been a few people talking about having like, you know, latent Gaussian processes and stuff like that. I think this is like a very satisfying version of an infinite dimensional variational autoencoder. Um, one thing I want to stress is that this, all these models are very flexible in terms of their likelihoods. So I, I mentioned before like common filters where we have like a, just a radar return that's maybe like linear Gaussian. And that's what people used to use because they had to do, they didn't have, you know, scalable stochastic variational inference. Um, now we can have any sort of crazy likelihood here. Um, so, you know, we can have like Laplace noise or, um, I don't know, some categorical variable. We could even have like little text models here. So imagine that these X's are like doctor's notes. And as long as we have a model that says, what is the probability of this text given this latent state of the patient, we can plug that into our model, no problem. We just have to be able to take gradients of this likelihood with respect to this continuous latent state, which is usually the case for any text model. So this is like a really, a really flexible model class. Okay. Um, so th um, there's like a couple more details. Uh, so just to, again, be clear what this, this generative model means, um, we'll have some distribution over the initial uh, state. That's just some marginal that we get from somewhere. Um, if we sort of go back enough far in time, it doesn't really matter very much. And we can just say that it's like marginally Gaussian or something. Um, then these dynamics, again, are defined by a stochastic differential equation. And it has some parameters given, it, it depends on F theta and sigma theta and some likelihood model, which is, you know, P of X given Z. So I said, we have to have some, somehow have a posterior over these latent trajectories and sort of satisfyingly, we can express that as another stochastic differential equation. So we're gonna have this function F phi and that's where our variational parameters are gonna live. And that's gonna say, uh, here's after having seen the data, uh, my sort of approximate posterior over trajectories. So again, this is kind of like a Gaussian process where we write down a prior over, um, yeah, I'll, I'll put it here. So in a Gaussian process, we write down a prior over functions. That's like our kernel function. That's kind of what this prior STE is. And then we have another Gaussian process or another, maybe it's not a Gaussian process depending on the likelihood, but we have another distribution over functions uh, after we condition on the data. So that's what we have here in this approximate posterior. There's one funny detail, which is that they have to share the same diffusion uh, otherwise, the KL divergence is infinite, and that might sound like, seem like a strong limitation, but it's not, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and you might also wonder what this elbow looks like for this infinite dimensional model, and it basically looks like the standard elbow where we have sort of the likelihood of the data given the latent um, trajectory, and then this like KL divergence term, which ends up being integral over time. It, en it ends up being like a... Uh, another stochastic differential, differential equation that depends on the two drifts, the drifts of the prior and the drift of the posterior, their square difference scaled by the, um, the scale of the noise. So basically this uh, KL divergence just basically says along averaged over random trajectories in my posterior, how different does the prior and the posterior dynamics look? So it, 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 this kind of just looks like the difference between the two Gaussians. Anyway, the point is that we can throw this all into, <clears throat> this is just another SDE. So we can estimate this expectation by just sampling from this approximate posterior dynamics and evaluating this quantity. That gives us an unbiased estimate of the um, lower bound on the marginal likelihood. So this is just like training a standard variational autoencoder, except we have SDE solvers inside of our, um, inside of our expression for the elbow. Okay, so, that's all the that's all the math now for the fun applications and conceptual stuff. So one thing we can do with this uh, model is let's just warm up by fitting it to uh, to data in one dimension. And the beautiful thing is, again, we can use whatever likelihood we want. So in the Gaussian processes, we typically have to somehow 
force things, everything to be Gaussian likelihoods or approximate them with Gaussian likelihoods so that everything stays a Gaussian process. Here, the sky's the limit. Um, so here we're actually using a Gaussian process prior, the OU prior. Uh, and so you can see its uh, drift function here. It just kind of basically steers the trajectories to be around uh, zero. And then the likelihood is Laplace around each of these uh, pluses. And now when I optimize the parameters of the approximate posterior SDE, this, uh, you know, the approximate posterior comes to fit the data. And of course it follows Bayes' rule, right? So it it's certain about the uh, value of the latent trajectories near where there's lots of data and away from the data, it's less certain. Makes sense. So, and now these arrows are showing you what that posterior drift is. And you can see that even though the, I was saying it's funny that they have to share the prior, they have to sh share the diffusion with the prior, um, marginally the posterior can be as sort of tight or as loose as you want. The drift function just kind of steers everything and squishes all the mass as tightly as you want, no matter how much noise there is added at each step. Okay, so uh, I'm saying we should explore this model class and I want your help doing it. And we have uh, source code available for all this stuff in PyTorch and I'll put a link at the end. Um, and everything that we've done has been set up to make things scalable. So we are again we're using stochastic variational inference, adaptive step solvers, and everything is like linear in the number of parameters in our models. So we can scale up to huge, like, you know, huge neural networks and huge numbers of states. We can even use higher order uh, solvers depending on how you want to constrain that diffusion function. Um, so to warm up, let's do a little bit of comparison of like sort of the only other tractable model class in this space is Gaussian processes. So again, they have to specify their mean and kernel hyperparameters for the prior functions. We specify this drift and diffusion function. Uh, the place where Gaussian processes really fall over, I think, is that as soon as you want to do anything interesting with them, like give them non-Gaussian likelihoods or, you, you know, transform them marginally by, for instance, exponentiating them, you don't have a Gaussian process anymore and you have something that you just can't sample from, you can't characterize it, um, or rather you can't evaluate its density very easily. But for SDEs, uh, you can, again, have arbitrarily, uh, well, they have to be slightly nicely behaved, like differentiable likelihoods, but, um, and you can have all these marginal transforms and you still end up with an SDE of the same sort of parametric family. Um, of course, Gaussian processes have a big advantage that they work fine for like spatial fields and all sorts of like multi-dimensional things. In these sort of standard stochastic differential equations, there really can only be one sensible uh, dimension that you're varying over. You can have like a, a vector valued state that's changing over a scalar valued time, but you, I'm not really, it's not obvious to me that you could ever use this for something like a scalar field, at least in a scalable way. Okay, um, so here's like our very initial our initial results. Um, like this is like a year and a half old now of fitting uh, data to motion capture. So the idea is that the data is uh, 50 dimensional. It's just like the position of all these joints and we'll choose a six dimensional latent space, learn the dynamics shared over a bunch of trajectories and because it generalizes all the previous continuous time models, it sort of has to do better, at least as good as them, and it does a little better. Um, okay, so now I'm just gonna talk a little bit more about like the what's going on now and, and the future, and then I'll wrap up. So um, one sort of limitation of stochastic variational inference is that we have this extra variance when we're training in our gradients due to sampling our latent Z. Um, and so even if you sort of get near the true posterior, you kind of bounce around forever. However, some work uh, from 2017 uh, and sort of sort of popularizing a sort of well-known trick among variational experts, uh, variational inference aficionados that says you can remove this one term, um, this like score function term from the standard gradient and the variance of the gradient of your approximate posterior will go to zero as you approach the true posterior. Um, so you kind of like, we call it like sticking the landing. Of course, this isn't actually all that valuable in most settings, because usually we're just gonna use like a Gaussian or something simple to approximate the posterior. So we're never gonna get close to the true posterior. But because uh, SDEs are kind of like closed under conditioning, we, our approximate posterior can get arbitrarily close to the true posterior if we use a sort of big enough neural network for the dynamics of the approximate posterior um, drift function. 
And so, you know, uh, just here's a, a sort of example where we're showing uh, that we can fit a multimodal posterior using a single SDE, right? We don't have to use a mixture model. A single SDE can already produce sort of multimodal posteriors in this infinite dimensional space. And so if we use, uh, so one thing we did was we extended this uh, sticking the landing trick to this sort of infinite dimensional hierarchical setting and then lowered the variance of our gradient estimator that way. Um, so I wanna just quickly talk about, there's a few different directions that I'd like to take this in. So one is multiple time scales. Another one is like adding jump processes and sort of like instantaneous uh, like levy processes to this, this family. I'd love to talk about applications to population genetics or finance or epidemiology, whatever you're doing. Um, we've also had an application to infinitely deep Bayesian neural networks where we say, what if you had a ResNet with different weights at every layer, take the infinitesimal limit of sort of more and more layers and you end up with another a, a neural network that uh, has sort of infinitely many layers and evaluating it that corresponds to sampling a trajectory from an SDE. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> using these elbows and things like that, we can fit this to data. And it ha uh, the cool thing is that we can apply our lower variance gradient trick. So uh, in principle, we can have lower variance gradients than standard Bayesian neural networks by, a lot, by using this like very uh, sort of expressive family of, of posteriors. Um, okay, and um, <clears throat> I'm actually, the last thing I wanna talk about is that I think this whole, uh, where I wanna take this whole uh, set of methods is to multiple scale or multi-scale physical models. Like in climate models, people have like coarse grained simulations where they use to make long range projections. And then when they have lots of data, they sort of make finer and finer grained um, versions of the same models, then they have this complicated assimilation process, all these ad hoc ways for making the different scales agree. I'm pretty sure we can do this all in this sort of like nice automatic sort of self-tuning way if we just say that our uh, model is one giant sort of hierarchical HMM, which corresponds to particular forms of stochastic differential equations. So I don't have time to really talk about the details too much, but the idea is that in many systems, there's like a slowly changing part and a quickly moving changing part. Um, and we'd like to reason about the quickly changing parts without having to simulate it in like detail for all the times when there's no data going on. So by stratifying things into multiple scales, just like the climate scientists do, um, we should be able to make these long range predictions and skipping over all the low level details once they've mixed back to the conditional prior. Um, so just some like very preliminary work is that um, the elbow has terms that sort of go to zero when you do this sort of multi-scale decomposition. So I, I'm pretty sure there's a way forward to allow us to build these like automatic multi-scale models. Okay, so uh, the other sort of remaining task is how do we regularize these dyna dynamics to be easy to solve? Uh, we've done a little bit of work on this recently at, at NeurIPS. So. I'd like to thank my colleagues and the people who have really done the bulk of this work, um, especially Zhou Chen Li, um, who sort of did the initial, like the details of the theory of our initial gradient estimators and the variational lower bound. Winnie Zhu, who worked out all the uh, Bayesian neural network extensions. Leonard Wong, who did all the probability theory. Ricky Chen and Yuli Rubinova, who did most of the original latent ODE work. Thank you very much. And if you're interested in following up, I'd love to talk to you. And you can also play with the code yourself at this URL. Great. Am I live? I don't know. Probably live. I don't know. David, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Oh, I, I see that in the back end that you say 10 seconds and then a switch to me. I, I guess it's still running. Oh, I'm live. Hi, everybody. Hi, David. Thank you for the talk. It's, it, it was, um, I've been mar aware of your work, but never seen it end to end uh, like this presentation. It's, uh, it's really awesome. Um, so actually I, I have a bunch of questions on the last few slides, but, uh, I am going to do the, uh, responsible thing and just, uh, ask other people questions first. <laughs> um, so actually let me, let me have so many windows open with questions. Okay. So, um, uh, we received a question. Could you comment on how easy or hard the backward solver task is a function is as a function of the dynamic function, the dynamics function. Are there good properties that we may want to encode in dynamics functions, which capture practically interesting dynamics while also being easy to solve? 
<clears throat> yeah, so that's a great question. And I, I think one that we should be worried about. Um, so certainly if the dynamics on the forward pass are convergent, then that'll make the system kind of ill-conditioned or stiff on the reverse pass. And in general, we can't have both the forward pass and the reverse pass being very well conditioned. Um, and so I think same for the neural ODE work. I think numerical, like differential equation people were rightly worried about our claims that you can run things backwards and reconstruct to arbitrary accuracy. I mean, so I'd say you can. The question is, the reverse pass is still well posed. It just can be very ill-conditioned and it might require you to take such small steps that it's not worth the uh, extra time cost uh, just for this memory savings. So the good news is that if your reverse trajectory doesn't reconstruct the forward trajectory very well, you can detect that because you probably won't end up at the same initial starting point. Um, so then you can just say, okay, well, let me do some more checkpointing or resolve things in sections on the forward pass. There's a whole series of like time and memory trade-offs that you can do when you have this stiff system. However, luckily in the sort of like cowboy deep learning setting where we don't use any prior information and we just make all our models super huge and over parameterized. In my experience, usually the optimizer can find a set of dynamics that can be solved on the forward and reverse pass pretty easily by whatever solver you're using. And I, I guess my intuition for why this happens is that if your solver can't handle the reverse pass, then the gradient will just be bad and it'll send you to another part of the space and you'll bounce around until you end up in a part of the space where your gradient estimator kind of works. However, that's very hand wavy and very, again, cowboyish. And I guess I'll say um, we don't have to rely on being able to actually solve the SDE backwards. We can do checkpointing if that fails for whatever reason. I see. So, so for for with checkpointing though, you would be restricted to only do it, at, you know, at the given interval that is determined by the memory that you have, right? Yeah, but there's all sorts of adaptive schemes because again, you can monitor the error of the reverse, um, the reverse solve, and if you oh, need so to, you can. you can always run things forward again um, from the beginning if you want to reconstruct something. So as long as you're willing to stop and and think whenever <clears throat> the numerics get bad, you can always get an arbitrarily good answer with without having to actually solve the dynamics backwards. Interesting. Yeah, cool. Um, all right, actually, we got another super interesting question, uh, which, which I would not have thought about. Um, uh, they're saying it would be cool to know your thoughts on the potential for scientific discovery. For instance, if in any of your experiments, you recovered non latent dynamics from obs observations of a well understood system. Um, so that's a Great point. We haven't actually played around with this model class all that much. So Joy Chen Lee got this stuff working and we ran it on mocap and then he went off to Stanford. <laughs> and uh, uh, we haven't really, we got distracted by the next paper we wrote in this series was about these infinitely deep Bayesian neural networks. Um, but the sort of the next paper I'm hoping to write is actually applying this to time series and all that stuff that at the end where I skipped over like the multi-scale SDE things, I think we should be able to build models where um, the prior dynamics are something like an Ising model or a magnetic field or, or some like very like Planck scale, very expensive physical dynamics. But the approximate posterior can have extra auxiliary variables that might correspond to things like temperature or pressure that don't actually exist in the original system at the finest level. They're just there to help us do approximate inference quickly. So I guess I'll say I'm excited by that direction, but I've never actually gotten it to work. Uh, because we haven't played around with it for real time series very much beyond the mocap data. Oh no, I see Nicola frozen, but maybe I'm the one who's frozen. Sorry, I'm back. It finally okay. happened uh, for the first time in whatever, 10 episodes, my internet went down in the middle of one of these things. Uh, sorry about that. I, uh, the last thing I heard was Ising models, but probably everybody listening has heard more. Uh, um, cool. Um, so I actually, I, I, I have a question because of, I'm a bit selfish here. I have a couple of questions. The first one was on, you, you made a reference to uh, population genetics, I think. Um, is the idea of using these models to detect drift in, you know, allele frequencies, for instance, or like evolutionary models or what? Uh, oh, well, so my understanding is that population geneticists already use <coughs> SDE models. Um, so, you know, and they just compare them and, and they say, you know, one theory corresponds to a drift function that looks like this and another theory yes. corresponds to this other drift function. So 
with and but then they use some things like you know approximate Bayesian computation and all these likelihood free methods it's because they can't marginalize over anything and the likelihoods are all very terrible so I'm not really sure how to address the likelihood issue because like in this setting we just need the likelihoods to be differentiable with respect to some latent state so I'm not sure how much of a problem that will be but I guess I'll say at least now we can provide a tool for integrating over the latent trajectories mm -hmm. and hopefully choosing some of these parameters by something more like marginal likelihood um, but to be honest I don't know that much about population genetics it's just an application of SCEs that I've been meaning to learn about so yeah, again I would love to collaborate with anyone here who actually knows about these models interesting we may be able to set you up with that because I, I think one and I'm curious to, to, to see if it's possible in your mind one interesting application would be to actually detect which parts of a genome for instance are under selective pressure mm. and with your model with your latent you know I think we can model with your W at the top right you can you can basically have selective pressure um on certain parts of the genome I'm yeah I, I, I'm not sure you probably have to do it over time and space jointly which I'm not sure you can do um because you have you have space across the genome in addition to time over the, yeah you say so anytime there's a spatial dimension you know it, it's sort of like a stochastic PDE and so if we want to stick it into this framework we have to do some sort of discretization of space or something like that so I see yeah interesting um and cool. And, and the other questions is around your the multi-scale models that you you went through uh, qu quickly at the end. Uh, they look super interesting. Um, I'm trying to reconcile them in a in a Gaussian process framework, and now one would do the same thing in a GP framework, probably through like some kind of co-regionalized model or some multitask GP. But then you wouldn't have the same uh, only fit the complex model to the rich data and then model rough dynamics everywhere else. Uh, yeah, that's the funny thing about GPs is that everything is an undirected graphical model sort of fundamentally. So the nice thing about SDEs is that you can actually draw arrows <clears throat> and have DAGs instead of just UGMs. So I'm, you could have a multi-scale latent, uh, like a GP LVM with like one of these um, latent GPs. I guess, I think it would also be able to support the same marginalization properties actually. It's funny because people say people like to say one model, model is causal versus another, but I feel like that's very vague. But I, I guess I will say that I think SDEs are a bit, a bit more natural fit for time series models. Um, but I don't know if I can make any strong claims about that. They're like more causal in some sense. <laughs> I see. Uh, you're, you're saying something or you're thinking? Oh, well, I guess one thing I'm hoping to talk to you or just to brainstorm about is this Venn diagram of here's Markov SDEs and here's GPs and they overlap like the Brownian motion is yes. both, both of these and they don't and like the white noise is a GP but it's not an S, a Markov SDE and I think this family of just Markov SDEs is much more flexible than GPs because you can support like marginal all these marginal transforms um, and the, fa the family of approximate posteriors is so rich but to be honest I don't have a great I wish I could say something more concrete about why this is a, a nicer, more general family, at least for, for one dimensional inputs. Uh, I see. Well, you know, even just the likelihood uh, that any differentiable likelihood works is is already a nice, nice thing to have because in GP world, it's it's a nightmare. Uh, yeah, and I mean, we, that it does come at the cost of having to do approximate, like stochastic variational inference, but you have to do something like that anyways, if you're using GP. Exactly. Exactly. Um, cool. Uh, we have another question, which is how do you uh, think about fitting these models to data with missingness when the missingness part patterns aren't uniform across the dimension of high dimensional data? So kind of missingness not at random in high dimensional <coughs> settings. Yeah, so that's actually really easy to do. And we did it in our uh, latent ODEs as a time. I forget what it was called. Latent ODEs for irregularly sampled time series data. We said you can put down a Poisson process likelihood on the time of the observations. And basically this allows you to um, oh. condition on the, the timing of, of an observation um, as part of your input. So the idea is like, this is very informative. Like if I have two medical records and one of them is a guy just shows up for his yearly checkup. And I don't, and I don't, even, I don't even know what the results of the checkup were. I just know the timing. 
and another guy who like is like regular checkup and then suddenly all sorts of tests. Probably the second guy is having some medical problems, even if I don't even know the results of those tests. And so, um, yeah, so the Poisson process likely lets us express that the chance that an observation is made is a function of the current state. Um, and it requires solving a ODE over time to, to evaluate the normalized likelihood of a Poisson process. But we have to solve ODEs across or SDEs across time to evaluate any of the marginal likelihoods in this model class. So it just ends up being one extra state that you send to your solver. And so, so we, we, we did that in that other paper. It didn't help that much for the uh, ICU data because everything is being measured all the time anyways. But we think that it's pretty easy to construct situations where the timing is, timing is informative. And I think that this generalizes all of the missing not at random um, models. Because again, if the, the fact that an observation was made can depend arbitrarily on the latent state and what the observation is also depends on that latent state. I think that's the fully general setting for the worst kind of missing not at random data. Thank you for that great question. Yeah, that's great. Uh, actually, could you comment on the, uh, maybe I missed it in your answer, but in the, in a high dimensional setting, uh, I guess it's high dimensional in observation space. The, I don't know what the, the, the because you could you could have missingness both in output space and input space, and uh, but I guess in a, does anything change when you have when it's missingness in high dimensional output? Probably not, right? So you can just ignore all the missing data in your high dimensional outputs. <clears throat> it's the classic, you know, when you have a DAG and you have leaf nodes. You can marginalize out the leaf nodes because they're going to sum to one always. So that's the beauty of uh, this this model class is that if I have like obviously I have missingness through time, and then even if some fraction of the observations are missing at every observation time, I just ignore those when I'm computing the likelihood, and it, that gives me the exact right answer. I see. That's neat. That's yeah, there cool. is one minor problem, yeah. which is that the encoder. Um, if you want to make it train it like a VAE, then the encoder has to somehow slurp up this partially missing data. But again, it's just an encoder, so you can just use like a special value, like make negative 999 or have an extra missing channel or whatever you want, right? Like there's no rules for the encoder. And if you train it for long enough, it can actually, it will learn to handle missing data in the right way. So, I mean, it's just doing supervised learning. Anyway, so the point is, it's about as good as you could hope it to be. And this is, the beauty of generative models is that they can handle missing data in this totally native, natural way. That's that's very interesting. Um, I guess, have you thought about, uh, you know, you discussed text and clinical notes. Have you thought about doing a video version of it? So basically computer vision like over time. Essentially. So it's funny because a bunch of people talked to me about that for the neural ODEs and I was sort of saying, I don't think it's that, it's probably not going to be worthwhile because if all your observations are discretized at the exact same time frequency, you might as well just discretize your model at that time frequency. And so the example, so people ended up doing neural ODEs for video where they wanted to interpolate between frames. Like they wanted right. to do super slow motion or, or some sort of like temporal super resolution. And I think then, then then it makes sense. But if you just want to do the normal time series thing of like predicting the future or having interpretable latent states, if you are doing like audio or, or video where everything is discretized at like 60 Hertz, you might as well just make your model update at 60 Hertz. Um, unless you want to do some fancy, fancy multi-scale thing. So. Well, or some fancy self-supervised thing probably, right? I wonder if uh, trying to predict missing frames at an, uh, you know, uh, infinitely many intervals between observations can actually be a good self-supervised measure. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. So I do want to say that the reason that I, like maybe I should, I should have said this more clearly in the talk is that these methods are kind of slow if you ah. use adaptive solvers. And I'd say one of the reasons is that this whole thing doesn't really fit well on the standard, standard GPU setting, right? Where we want to have like a giant matrix multiply and everything being very like, you know, a for loop over huge matrix events. When we have adaptive SDE solvers, there's like random number generation and like I showed you that tree stru data structure. That which was very neat. I didn't know about that. That was really cool. Oh, thanks. Yeah, so I'm actually working in a new programming language that's being developed um, called DEX. And it's like functional, dependently typed, and it's in principle, it can do a blend of sort of like CPU-ish, tree structured, interesting data structure, control flow, and big neural network things all on like a GPU or a TPU or whatever. But that's very experimental. 
So I guess I'll try to say for anyone who wants to play with these methods, they do work, but they're slow. So um, awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, we are at time. Uh, this was super cool, and I think I'm going to email you about a few things. <laughs> oh, but uh, thank you again for for the for the amazing presentation, and 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 thank you again for for sticking around to answer questions. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, Nicola. Bye. Thank you, everybody. See you next time for the last one.